I'm going to tell you something that is probably quite important. I'm going to give you some ideas about the future about computer science. And so I need to talk to you about the sort of where computer languages are going. So how many here of you here have a PhD in computer science? Oh, that's going to be tough. Um, <laughs> really? Nobody? I can't see the top. Maybe somebody up there? OK, so the thing is, why would you, why would you care about computer science? Why would you care about programming? You know, that's, it's a tough one. Um, and the thing is, I deeply care about it, and I'm hopefully trying to communicate to you why it's important. Um, one of the reasons why I think it's important is to do with uh, what you can do with it. Now, the thing is, I'm going to show you some things you can do with programming, and I'm hopefully going to convince you that it actually... Well, you put, how many of you actually have coded before? That's a better question. Oh, quite a few. Okay, so some of you have an idea what it is. I'm really addressing now everyone who hasn't coded, because hopefully the, by the end of this talk, you'll go away and you will start to code, because you probably have some preconception to what programming is, right? You think you know what it is, and it's, and it's probably to do with business. And we've all heard that we should teach children how to program because they'll get jobs, right? But, but since when was that a useful thing for, for school children to learn how to, to, to become, like, do we teach mathematics to get jobs in mathematics? Do we teach them PE to get jobs as sports people? I mean, it's ridiculous, isn't it? You don't, do you teach English so people will become writers? Not really. You teach these things because they're important, fabulous tools for their broader lives. Some people, of course, are going to become readers and writers as, as professionals. But of course, let's ask another question. How many of you here can read or write? <laughs> Not everyone's put their hands up. That's, <laughs> that's confusing. How many of you, keep your hands up, keep your hands up, come on. And then drop your hands if you're not a professional writer. Right. So why have you bothered? <laughs> Seriously, why have you bothered to learn? Like, and I mean, if we talk about this in programming terms, why should we teach programming in the same way? It's not that everyone needs to become a professional programmer. That's ludicrous. Lots of people will, and that's great. But lots of people will learn to program in the same way, for the same reasons, you've all learned to read or write. And I'm going to argue that that's because it's one of the most creative tools for expression that we have today. We just yet haven't discovered it. Well, you haven't. I have. And I'm hopefully going to try and share it with you. That's, that's the goal of today. Um, and so now we're really talking about education. We're talking about why we should share these things and what's important about it. And so when we start talking about programming in these terms, we need to then really communicate why we're doing it and, and how we can do this. And so one of the goals really here is to lower the barrier to entry. And so I've got this, this, this thing I'm going to show you, and it lowers the barrier to entry in three ways. The first way is cost, right? Computers are pretty expensive, and so not everyone has access to a computer. And certainly, children, they might have a, have a computer at home, but the parents, they don't want them to touch it because it's their, they don't know how it really works properly. So if the kids mess around with it, their emails break, <laughs> right? So don't touch the, computer, the family computer. So one way to do is to use one of these things here, which is a Raspberry Pi. Have anyone heard of Raspberry Pis before? So they're, they're fabulously cheap, like 25 pounds, right? So if you break this, it's not the end of the world. And so if you're a child, you should be able to get your parents to buy one of these uh, for Christmas or for a birthday. It's not crazy expensive. So that's one of the ways of, of lowering the barrier to entry. But of course, if you already have a computer at home, then use that if that's available to you. So just use a computer, or if you haven't got access to one, buy a Raspberry Pi. The second, uh, and then the other thing is software. Like this software here behind me, this thing called Sonic Pi, Where's the information here? Where are the buttons? There's some buttons here somewhere. What's going on with this? There we are, there's the buttons. Uh, show you some information. This software is entirely, entirely free. So that's another way of lowering the barrier to entry is cost. So cost of hardware, cost of software. The other way of lowering the barrier to entry is to make sure it's simple and easy to learn. Because that's another thing. Computing is a very complicated thing, typically, people say. But it doesn't have to be. Just like reading and writing isn't, isn't complicated. You don't start to learn a writing learn to read or write by reading Shakespeare, do you? Now, that would be a crazy thing to do. You learn to read by saying, apple, ball, right? And so that's how you start. And it's the same way with this programming system. I'm going to show you how to learn to program in a way that I've taught eight-year-old kids how to do this. And this software has been developed in primary schools and secondary schools with children the whole way through, watching and observing them use the software, and then modifying the software to make the next generation of kids have an easier life. And the cool thing about this is I've seen children do amazing things with the software. So I know that all you guys could do the same, too. Um, and then the third way to, to lower the barrier to entry is to create motivation. Like, why would you bother? If I say you need to learn to read or write because you can write legal documents, how many of you are going to do that? 
right? It's ridiculous. I mean, it's obviously you can get a job as a lawyer, that'd be a good thing, but you learn to read or write because you want to write le letters to your friends. It's Valentine's Day. You should write poems to our loved ones. Susanna, I'm going to write a poem later on. <laughs> I haven't done it yet, uh, but I will do. Uh, um, and also we can write diaries and all sorts of lovely things. So it's important to be able to express ourselves through reading and writing, and same with programming. We don't just want to learn to program. Like the typical thing I've seen, uh, I've seen uh, lots of uh, educational uh, sort of trusts and organizations create really exciting, engaging things for kids to learn to program. One of them was by a big examination board in the UK, and uh, the title was, Give Binary a Try. <laughs> <laughs> that sounds exciting to me. The other one was, have fun, this is a good stop, have fun with sorting. <laughs> How many of you ever had fun sorting anything in your entire lives? That's ridiculous, right? I mean, I love sorting my socks, that's a good thing. So we need to find ways that get to kids and get to everybody else. It's not just about giving binary a try, having fun with sorting. We need to think of, of tools to engage them in something that's meaningful to them. So enough talking, I'm going to spend the rest of the time showing this piece of software, which I, I hope solves all those things I've just described. So here it is, if you want to tweet about it, it's at sonic underscore pi is the, is the account. And let's get rid of this, this information now. And so the way to start is to try and think of a way that's, that's, that's meaningful to children, but it's also as simple as possible to get started. So we talked about play being an important concept. So let's write the word play, and then we can choose a number, because programming is all about numbers, isn't it? All right, so let's choose a number like this, and then, oh, it's very quiet. Can we turn it up a little bit? There we are. That's the first program you could possibly write in Sonic Pi. I'm just making a little beep. And actually, that may sound very simple and not very, very exciting, but kids go, whoa, that's amazing, a beep. <laughs> and so they really, they're, they're, you should see them. Their eyes just light up. And the cool thing about this is this is a full program. We have lots of opportunities for uh, learning opportunities for teachers to talk about what's going on here. There's a full program. There's functions. There's abstractions. Abstractions, that's a big word. Abstractions mean, really, things which map onto other things. So you take a domain, like numbers, and you map it onto another domain, right? But you need to have some kind of way to make that mapping happen. So this is, this is a question I ask lots of people, but rarely people seem to know the answer, which I'm quite confused about. So maybe you lovely guys from Manchester will be able to answer this question. What do numbers do? It's very quiet, right? You don't know. <laughs> they go up and they can go down. Come on. So the cool thing about these numbers is they can go up and down. So in the domain over here, what else can go up and down in music? Pitch, exactly, notes. So if I choose a higher number, I get a higher note. I choose a lower number, I get a lower note, right? So we're done, right? We've got to be, we can play all the possible notes in the world. Although these are all whole numbers, they actually map onto notes of a piano. So as I'm going up in whole numbers, I'm like moving from C to C sharp to D. And so here, actually, I can also do Numbers in between numbers. So this is more like a violin sliding. So this isn't a normal notion of piano, it's in between. So lots of things in just one line of code. Um, the next thing to do is to sort of make a melody. Because if you can make a note, let's make a melody. So let's choose note 80 and let's uh, play notes 85. A nice, nice melody here. And oh, that might be a surprise to you if you, if you think what's going to happen. I thought I was going to play 80 then 85. But this system is actually not just a programming coding tool. This system is a, a fully functional musical instrument. And I really mean it in, the, in, the, in the, the broadest possible terms. This is like a violin. This is like a guitar. No, really, this is a new kind of instrument that I hope you'll all learn to play. <laughs> I use this instrument to perform in nightclubs. As you can tell, the people have a great time <laughs> with these beats. It's wicked. Um, I'll show you in a moment, actually, where you can go with this. But, but yeah, so if, when we're talking about musical instruments, actually music really encapsulates one thing beautifully, and that's time. And if all the notes happened at the same time, well, that would be interesting, but it would limit to us where, where we can go with things. It would be a very quick performance. Blah! <laughs> so you want to be able to spread things out over time. So there's another important command in Sonic Pi which talks about time, and it's called sleep. So you can ask the computer to go to sleep for a second like this. So we, we're going to play note 80, we'll sleep for a second, and then we'll play note 85. This is obviously nightclub standard quality music. Brilliant. Um, but you might laugh at this, but at this point, I've pretty much done all of Western notation. Think about that for a moment. What is a melody? It's which notes to play and when to play them, right? What have I got here? I can play any notes. I can choose any length of time 
between each note. I can do any melody, I can do any bass line. I can take Mozart, I can take Beethoven, I can take Daft Punk, and I can represent it in this. And children do. They'll get, take their favorite melodies and they'll reproduce them with just two commands. So you can get started tonight downloading Sonic Pi for free, play sleep, play sleep, play sleep. My six-year-old niece at the time, when she was six, uh, I showed her these two commands and she could read and she could type in the keyboard. That's all she needed to be able to do. And she wrote hundreds of lines of this. You know, I was like, that's great. She said, I'm not finished yet. And she kept going, right? So you can do, have a lot of fun with these just two commands. But of course, if I'm making this claim I can play this in nightclubs, I need to be able to sort of convince you you can do a bit more. And so in addition to being able to make beeps, I can also uh, make sam play samples. So I can actually play pre-recorded sounds. So a really cool, famous sample is the Armen Break. Has anyone heard of the Armen Break? You all have. You just probably don't know what it's called. It sounds a bit like this. Right, so we're off, right? So uh, let's try and make it a bit louder. Uh, my volume slider. Here we are. And let's go. Right, this gives us lots of opportunities to talk about how we might manipulate sound. So there's a drum break, but, but in Sonic Pi you can do, all, like, and what I'm showing you in this, this next six minutes is just the tip of the iceberg, really. There's lots of depth. And one, one way to demonstrate this is you can not just play a sample, but you can manipulate it. So let's change the rate of its playback. So we play back at half speed. We're getting something which actually was used in pretty much exactly the same way by NWA with Straight Outta Compton, you know, really wrapping on top of this, Dr. Dre, swearing and things, uh, on top of this, right? So we take it, take a drum break, we stretch it out, we actually create some sort of early old school hip hop sound. And of course then, if we play at a normal, normal rate, this is the start of the drum and bass theme, you know, we start to mash it up and, and play around with it. Um, and then if you want to go forward a few more years, you took a look at sort of GABA and fast dance music, Jungle, right? <laughs> I've just changed a number to three different numbers and got three different genres of music. That's pretty cool, isn't it, right? Um, and so you can take any sample and manipulate it in this exact way. Another thing that you can do is you can take another sample, like this guitar sample. Uh, not that one, this one. Yeah. And these samples which are built in are all uh, Creative Commons Zero License. So. so that's quite nice. Sort of guitar sample someone's made. Change the rate to 0.5. So and I can then think about what else do I want to do? So in, in, uh, children will ask, say, if we're teaching computer science, they won't really ask how to do sorting. They'll say, well, how do I make that sound better? And you say, well, actually, this is a computer science lesson. You can't do that. Well, that's a rubbish answer, isn't it? So you want, some children will ask these questions, and you want to maintain their engagement, to maintain their motivation. And so one way to, to do it is to be able to say, yes, you can make this sound better. What do you mean by better? So one thing they might say is, well, when I listen to this kind of music, it sounds more roomy. What do you mean by that? Well, actually, if you think about this in studio terms, that means more reverb. So how do I add some more reverb to this? Well, I use some computer science. I, I, I use what's called a lexical scope. That's a fancy word, but it's just wrapping this round with some reverb. In the same way, I take my guitar, plug it into a reverb pedal, plug that into an amplifier. I can do the same with this code. I just need to write with effects reverb do to say where I want the reverb to start and end so I want the reverb to finish. And you'll see now that the sample is within the reverb. So now that sample will be played with reverb. So I can change a room size. So I can, in the same way you have guitar pedals have those knobs, I can change the knobs here and make, make even more reverb. And the child's like, yes, that's great. But also, I quite like it to do a bit more echoey stuff. Can you do that? Well, of course we can, sure. So what we need is to do a couple of these things. Let's do effects. Uh, echo. Now we've got echo and reverb. So, wow, well, I want it to sound a bit more lo fi. Can you do lo fi? I'm into 8 bit music. Cool, sure, I can do that. Uh, let's do like uh, with, with effects, uh, bit crusher, uh, bits, 8 do. And now we've got sort of sound, right? And we're, all we're doing is adding these things. And as you can see, all I'm doing is just adding and listening and adding and listening and adding and listening. And so this way, with this ability to play samples, make beeps, and of course, I'm not showing you, but you can do more than beeps. There's, there's about 20 different synthesizers built in. Each of those synthesizers is like a full synthesizer you will buy at a shop, with about 20 to 30 different controls to manipulate. So you have a huge range of sounds you can generate. And with the ability to do effects, you, and the ability to play these things through in time with the sleep command, you can do an insane number of different kind of compositions with this, with this tool already. But to be honest, that's boring, right? Composition is so old school. Where we want to be today, and where, where, where the electronic music is not today, where it should be, 
is live performance. When I go and see a rock band playing, I do not see them going on stage, sitting on the chair like this, cracking on a CD, going, ah, enjoy the CD, right? <laughs> whereas, whereas most electronic artists will actually just play a CD of their music, or the equivalent of, and maybe do a bit of tweaking. Because their work, their virtuosity, and there is a lot of virtuosity in electronic music, is mostly in the studios. They spend huge amounts of time in the studio really polishing the sound so that when they go on stage, it just sounds perfect. But who wants perfection? Surely modernism was a long time ago seen as a ridiculous idea that everything can sort of go towards this perfect idea. I want real people. I want real ideas. I want, I want risk on the stage. I want things to go wrong. And I want to see what happens when it goes wrong, because that, that makes things just uh, uh, tangibly live. And so with electronic music, we can start to do this when we start to use code. And at this point, you need to add something else. We've got this thing called the live loop. And so if I, do, if I call this Sally, the live loops need to have a name, I can play like a sample and a bass drum, and like this, and then sleep for half a second, and now I've got a loop. Right, so we're already sort of in the club that's going. But of course, at this point, I can actually, whilst it's playing, I can change aspects of the sounds. So change the cutoff value, and then start to bring it up. Right, and so all I'm doing is changing a number, and you can see I'm actually performing. And so uh, maybe uh, Jane is going to play, uh, she's going to synchronize with Sally, so they can play at the same time. Play another sample, let's play loop, uh, not the arm in break, industrial. Let's beat stretch that to uh, one beat, and see for one. Now I've got something that's going a bit, bit more interesting, right? And so at this point, I'm starting to make a Daft Punk track, and I'm thinking, how do I make the, the, the melody to this? Well, in, I've only got like one minute left, so I'm gonna just skip straight to the, the, the point. In Sonic Pi, when you download it at home, which you all will tonight, if you click on, <laughs> Uh, uh, if you click on the help button, you get a full tutorial written assuming you know nothing about code and nothing about music. So if you know either of those things, you'll whip through it. But if you don't, it's there for you. And my promise is to you is if you don't understand some of these things, then please email me and I'll help you out. And then I'll improve the tutorial for the next people. And I can actually do a full performance. And I do this weekly on a Thursday. So you're going to tune in to my performances. You'll see me live stream this out. And then I do this in nightclubs. So, so please have a play, and please change your attitudes about what programming is. It is one of the most creative things we have available today. It is something which is entirely, entirely available for you to understand. It's not something complicated. It's just something that needs patience. And just like reading or writing, if you see symbols, that you, if you couldn't read or write, you see these crazy symbols. When you can't read code, you see crazy symbols. But of course, those who can write, who can read, can have a, a, a much more fulfilled and exciting life because they can express themselves in new ways. Just imagine how you could express yourself with code if you could learn too. Thank you very much.